Unreliable, entitled, unprofessional. You may have heard boomers use these words to describe millennials back when they entered the workforce. Now it's Gen Z's turn. Born roughly between 1997 and 2012, Gen Z is making waves with their older co-workers. These 20-somethings are digital natives, they prioritize work-life balance, and they are changing the workplace as we know it. Welcome to Stress Test, a personal finance podcast for millennials and Gen Z. I'm Roma Luzio, personal finance editor at The Globe and Mail. And I'm Rob Carrick, personal finance columnist at The Globe. Your career is a major way to fast track your personal finance goals. An important part of that is navigating workplace culture. That culture is seeing a major shift with the latest cohort of young workers. Gen Z has a reputation for being direct about what they want, and they're not afraid to turn down work that doesn't align with their values. After the break, we'll speak with two Gen Zs who took a stand for what they wanted in the workplace. My name is Batul. I live in Toronto and I'm 27 years old. Batul is an engineer. She graduated from university in 2020 and found a full-time job in the construction industry. She was the only woman on two projects and worked predominantly with white men in their 40s, 50s and 60s. Um, The thing that I've noticed about how different generations approach work is the one big thing is about mental health. There's no such thing as having a bad day or taking a day off for self-care. When it came to their generation, I was made fun of for taking two days off. And that was just me using my vacation time. But I remember getting comments like, "Um, no, you're not allowed to take a day off. It's like, yeah, but I just wanted to take a day off because I wasn't feeling well. Um, But that's something that they you know, you grind through it, you grind through the pain regardless of how much you're hurting. And that's physical, mental, emotional, it didn't matter. But there was a huge disconnect when it came to mental health. She felt like her older co-workers' lives revolved around their jobs. And that's certainly not how Batul sees work. I think the difference is with us, especially my generation, we see things and we see a lot of different things because we're exposed to the world at our fingertips. And we see how a nine to five can look or, or how a nine to five is not supposed to look. And because we have these various options for our life, we get to choose which one we want and we get to compare the differences. And I think in their generation, because it's the only thing they saw, they think that that's the only right thing. And then with us, because we're exposed to so many different things, we kind of create our own perception and then we create a choice for ourselves. You should be working towards making something better or making yourself better or helping community in that sense. So once you kind of curate that personal goal for yourself, it's not about making money anymore. It's about fulfilling yourself and doing something that's purposeful. Her first job was not ticking these boxes. Instead, it became a source of extreme stress. Six months into that job, I had one of the coordinators that I work with, so he was at a higher position than I was, uh, go off on pat leave. They told me, I think about a month before he was leaving, that I was going to be taking over his position. And when I asked if I was going to be compensated for this, they said no, and that they would use this as a trial run for my promotion. I somehow said yes to that because who doesn't want a promotion and who doesn't want to shine? But what ended up happening is I was not only doing my own full-time job, but I was also doing his full-time job. So I was doing two people's full-time jobs here. And that can get a bit too stressful for somebody who's only six months into their career. And because that was too much, I got burnt out. She expected the extra work to be temporary. But one month in, she learned her colleague wasn't coming back. Burnout for me looked uh, really bad. I got a lot of body pain and it was predominantly in my back. Um, But I remember I could barely sleep. I could barely eat. I was extremely anxious. I used to have a headache all the time. The stress also had an impact on her relationships. It culminated in a panic attack. And I remember one of my coworkers, uh, he looked at me and he goes, are you okay? 
And I went, no, I'm not okay. And then I remember I ended up going home early afternoon. And he was like, yeah, I think you should go home. And, you know, when it comes to a point where people are making fun of you for taking days off and then they look at you in your face and you're like, yeah, I think you need to go home. It's it's a huge difference. Um, and that was kind of when I decided that I can no longer continue the way that I've been continuing. And I started talking to some of my other friends and they kind of gave me the advice of you need to talk to HR. You need to talk to your manager. You need to talk to somebody. So I actually booked an appointment with HR. I booked an appointment with my manager. Um, I sat people down one by one and I told them the situation. I said, I can no longer do this. And then the advice that I got was take a step back. Your career is going to be okay. So knowing that gave me a lot of satisfaction in being okay with taking a step back and, and clearly setting boundaries of being like, I can't do this anymore. And you need to put somebody else in this position to take over all of these other tasks that are not mine. As for the promotion they dangled at the beginning? I never got a promotion. I never got a raise. I never even got a good job. We're so proud of you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for sacrificing your life, your blood, blood, sweat and tears. I got nothing. Absolutely nothing. She stuck it out at that company for a bit longer. But ultimately, she knew she wanted to quit. I would say I I quiet quit at that point. Like I'm talking. So I used to work 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we used to have a meeting at 7 a.m. in the morning. I literally made the decision that I was not going to show up to this meeting anymore. And I would strictly show up after 9 a.m. And I would leave at 3 period. And they noticed, but they couldn't say anything to me because I was like one year into this job. I was pretty good at it. I had given them, I had shown them what I could do. So at that point, I felt like I was not on the bottom anymore and you couldn't tell me what to do. So I started doing whatever I wanted to do, which was kind of great. And I actually started using work time to start applying to other jobs. I got a couple of interviews. I did my interviews during work hours and I secured another job. And that was that. In her current job, she works with more women and people her own age. She says her employer is good at treating people like actual people, not just workers. She feels no pressure to stick it out at a job where she's not happy. As somebody who has had three jobs in under one year, I am so pro switching jobs where you are not happy. Yes, staying longer at a place, you do learn more and you get more qualified in that particular position. But I'm also a firm believer that when you are young in your career, you should try all the things because you don't know what you like and what you don't like. And I honestly think it's a personal disservice to yourself if you stay in a place which you hate because you're going to hate yourself and you're going to hate what you do. And the next thing you know, you're 10 years in. You've got a family, you've got kids, and now you can't quit. But when you're 22, 25, why wouldn't you do something that you like more? And she has some advice for boomers, Gen X, or millennials dealing with Gen Z's entrance into the workplace. I think one thing that managers should consider while mentoring Gen Z's is to stop looking at them as crybabies and people that complain all the time. Our generation truly wants to see change and truly wants to do something that's good for not just them, but for the rest of society and people to come. And instead of being like, you know, just keep following the wheel. This is how we've done it. So you should do it like this. But instead, listen to them and ask them, hey, what would you do? And how would you change this? Because they will have another idea. They will make a change. Change is going to come regardless. So just listen to the change. Our next guest convinced his boss to move the entire company to a four-day work week. Uh, so I'm Mikhail. I'm 28 and I live in Toronto. I am a behavioral scientist at an insurance company. Mikhail's first full-time role was with a small company where he started as an intern. The company had about 20 people, predominantly women, and a fairly innovative culture. Still, there were challenges. Uh, yeah, so I definitely noticed uh, the company having some turnover issues, like I said, and I lots of churn and people were leaving, I was partially assuming from burnout potentially and just 
seeming exhausted, like replying to emails at 10 p.m., doing a lot of work in a tight uh, time frame with a lot of high expectations and demands. And yeah, just feeling that they don't really have the time for their personal life, like a feeling that their the balance isn't there and it's heavily skewed towards their life and the demands of their job. When he got a chance to propose a change to the workplace, he took it. And I had a conversation with um, someone from the leadership team at the organization that asked, uh, what do you want out of this role in this career? Uh, and, you know, I knew the like expected professional growth path at that company. And it was, I saw my more senior colleagues that were working long hours and I knew I didn't want to do that. So, so when she asked me that, I said, you know, I'd really love to work four days. Uh, and then in the new year, the head of the company reached out and we had a conversation. She asked why I was interested in working uh, four days. Uh, and I kind of talked about uh, a lot of the, you know, talking points on how it's better for, not just for my own personal experience, but just the the concept in general and how, you know, it's better for employees in a lot of ways that allows them to refresh and recharge, which is super relevant to this sort of knowledge sector uh, economy. Um, we're having kind of a like sharp and motivated mind is so much more productive. And uh, also the benefit for employers in terms of like retention, it piqued her interest. Uh, and she's also definitely someone that's really open to um, new ways of working, uh, new ways of thinking. And we set up just a more formal um, discussion at the whole leadership team. And I prepared a couple slides that kind of went into a bit more detail on the, the concept. He questioned why we work five days in the first place. You know, it's not really something that's been optimize over time. It's kind of uh, an arbitrary figure that we landed on. Um, like a, for most of the industrial revolution, we worked six days. Sunday was off as sort of a, a product of Christianity. And then I think it was in 1908, a New England cotton mill um, gave their employees Saturdays off so that their Jewish workers could honor the Sabbath. And then in uh, 1926, Henry Ford also gave employees Saturday and Sunday off. And he also had this idea with more leisure time, people would buy more cars. And for so for so much of time, like more leisure time was seen as like a sign of moral progress. And we seem to have lost that uh, sort of goal or narrative, I guess. Then he pointed to evidence that the four-day work week is well working. There's a, a big pilot in Iceland, which is I think the largest pilot they had done. It was like over four years and it was all like public sector employees. Um, that they actually found it increased productivity. Uh, employees were way more satisfied with their work-life balance, um, with their with their job. Pretty solid evidence that shows that productivity is either remaining constant or in some cases even increasing. It's a pretty compelling argument, especially for companies that kind of feel open to taking that risk maybe or feel that it kind of fits with their type of work. The leadership team was skeptical at first, but ultimately they agreed to try a 40 work week. Mikhail says turnover dropped and the policy is still in place. He was willing to raise the idea because the organization was so open-minded. I'm not very good at uh, the sort of corporate game of saying what uh, you're expected to say. Uh, not in a way that like, like I'm not uh, antagonistic or anything, but I think like, yeah, with that organization, I guess like it wasn't something that I didn't feel that I was, I was taking a huge risk if there was a chance that they were like, oh, well, um, Mikhail's not really interested in growing hair, so we're not going to invest uh, in him. Yeah, that was, I guess, a risk that I was, I was willing to take. Mikhail has since left the company for a role that is more aligned with what he studied and what he wants to do with his career. Plus, he got a significant salary increase and more responsibilities. Those are pretty traditional reasons to switch jobs, but he sees a difference in how Gen Zs perceive their careers versus previous generations. Our generation has been a bit disillusioned by uh, these narratives of kind of work being something that is, you know, a major part of your identity and one of the most a very fulfilling thing in your life. And then this assumption that we should be channeling the things that we love the most into like a source of income wanting more time from work doesn't mean that you dislike the work. It's just more so that desire for 
like balance. And I think that the, I mean, just in general, apart from work itself, Gen Z, and I think they're just as a generalization, better at like self-reflection and really thinking about what they value and what they want um, in life and in a career, uh, as opposed to um, what sort of institutional narratives or social norms kind of suggest they should value or want from from life or from a career. The four day work week was one way he found to balance work and life. If you like someone who wakes up at like seven and goes to bed at ten uh and works nine to five, like that's uh it's almost like forty percent of your waking consciousness spent at work. Uh and I mean to me that just feels like a lot. And as someone who studied economics and decision making, I think a lot, probably way too much about opportunity costs, you know, that time and how it could be channeled for other areas of fulfillment. Um, And I think it's another like generational difference where maybe younger generations are, you know, they are still focused on their career, but are also equally focused on maybe personal um, growth and and fulfillment, uh, as opposed to just like professional, you know, time is very finite and having that time to also pursue, you know, fulfilling personal relationships, being able to spend time, more time with family and friends to pursue other intellectual interests or or hobbies and see feeling the, yeah, fulfillment from that, as opposed to mostly like over indexing on the professional avenue, uh, and, you know, spending time learning about more personal interests as opposed to you know spending time working on presentation skills or getting better at excel for example after the break we'll speak with an organizational behavior expert on how gen z is changing the workplace Dave Drury is the Associate Director of the Work Learn Institute at the University of Waterloo. Hi, Dave. Welcome to Stress Test. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so Dave, Stress Test is a podcast for Gen Z and Millennials. We often group them together, but Gen Z is very distinct. Can you tell us generally how the two generations differ? So I would probably say the highest level area of agreement is that Gen Z is probably more individualistic as uh, compared to previous generations. And I want to almost pause right there and say, when I say individualistic, I don't mean selfish. Um, It doesn't mean selfish. It just means more interested in learning and development and growth and getting better over time. And we see that play out in uh, in various ways when it comes to the workplace regarding things like interest in work-life balance. This is like the big thing that most big surveys would probably tell you that Gen Z is really interested in having a balance between the things that they do at work and the things that they do outside of work compared to different generations. And that's probably because they've really seen previous generations struggle with that sort of balance. And they've seen, they've now learned the negative consequences of a lack of that balance. Relatedly, they have more exposure to um, the issues of mental health and they might even be coming up with those issues personally. So there's a greater interest in exploring work experiences that provide space for that and work-life balance, you know, typically meaning like flexible work arrangements or time away from work or flexible work days. We've learned that that's just a really important space for them to maintain that health. The last thing that I might say is, um, and this isn't new, this isn't something that's just coming from my colleagues and I, but they really seem to celebrate diversity. And it goes hand in hand with their interest in individuality because they themselves want to show up as their authentic selves in the workplace. They're looking for employers who provide space for everyone to show up and be themselves. And that means they're more welcoming of people to be diverse. It sounds to me like some of the things that you're describing um, entail them being uh, quite informed at a young age. Globally, the data suggests that Gen Z is going to be the most educated generation of all time, at least so far. Their graduation rates, their participation in higher education, especially in emerging economies in places like Africa, suggest that they're going to be smarter than pretty much anyone, at least in terms of formal education. And 
in the background, we also have to remember that they're the most technologically connected generation of all time. So I'm a millennial. I grew up at a time pre-smartphones transition into a time where we had that sort of access. They've always had it. So they've always had this information at their fingertips. And I think as a result, they've been able to access information on what a good organization looks like, what good work-life balance looks like, for instance. So I would totally agree Mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. I recently read a report, um, it was from Deloitte, and it was looking at a global audience. And it found that Gen Z want purpose-driven work was one of the main findings that they'll turn down work that doesn't align with their values. Is that something that you would agree with? I would totally agree with it. Pew, SAP, McKinsey, Deloitte, EY, pretty much every big survey company, every big management consultant organization has done a survey of Gen Z because we're still asking questions about what this generation wants from their workplace. And they all kind of say the same thing, that Gen Z is deeply passionate about finding meaningful work, finding purpose. And again, I think that's because they've just observed so many generations live through the monotony of uh, work that lacks purpose. I think they've really started to appreciate that and they're actively seeking it. And as a consequence, perhaps because there is such a fight for talent on the employer side, they've also been more mobile, meaning that they've been willing to leave their organizations. If they find that they're in a situation where the employer isn't fulfilling their end of the bargain, they're out. And unfortunately, some media have portrayed that as a lack of commitment or disloyalty. They've kind of painted that in the wrong light. And I actually just think it means that Gen Z is standing up for what they believe in. And they're really trying to find a situation where they can uh, enact their values in the workplace. So it's a really complicated generation. I think they're starting to realize that life is so much more than work, but they're also under such financial stress that they realize, God, I got to work really hard to have to maintain the same lifestyle that the previous generations have had. Mm -hmm. I want to touch on that in a second. But let's talk a little bit about something that you brought up a couple times, which is how older generations perceive Gen Z. Are there any main stereotypes that are exaggerated? Are there misunderstandings? What are some of the untruths about how a boomer or a Gen X might see a Gen Z? Probably something to do with I'll use the word organizational commitment, which is sort of like the bond between an individual and an organization at an emotional level. There's people who study this. And it's really important to both individuals and organizations because it predicts performance and job satisfaction and how long you'll stay in in a role. The survey data would suggest that Gen Z has a lower level of commitment than in previous generations. And consequently, we see this bigger phenomenon like the great resignation or quiet quitting. This is the sort of media portrayal of the, of a generation. One way to interpret that is we've got a generation of people who are unambitious, who don't care about their employers. They're just out to make a buck. They have no loyalty. How dare they? But another way is to think about Gen Z as a generation that really wants to live a life that's consistent with their values. And they're putting employers in the spotlight. And they're asking these questions of employers to say, what are you doing to create a work experience for me that's consistent with my values? And if the answer is, I'm doing very little, Gen Z is saying, thanks very much. I'm going to take my services somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that strikes me when I'm listening to you describe this is there seem to be, uh, over the years, less and less reasons for people to remain with a single employer. Uh, There is a lot less pensions that would tie people to jobs. The benefits are not as good. Uh, In my mind, it seems like that uh, idea of loyalty to a single employer um, is sort of, you know, going out the window as much because of what the company is offering and not offering as it is about the attitude of the employee. They're intertwined because if we go back 50 years ago, like the classic example is probably in the public service, you might have heard the phrase, the golden handcuffs, like a situation where regardless of the experience of actually working, the defined benefit plan is just so good that it really doesn't make sense to leave your role. Well, that's not really a phenomenon that anyone has to worry about these days because that's not a tool that many organizations have to keep people around. You know, there's more gig work, there's more contingent work, part-time you know, seasonal, that sort of stuff. So I think I think new employees, Gen Z new employees, people who are entering the labor market are starting to think, okay, well, what are some other things that matter to me? The fringe benefits, like the pensions and stuff, if those are off the table, I think job security is the thing because they've just seen 
how volatile the labor market can be. And they've seen, you know, as recently as last year, big tech companies laying off some really well-paid folks in fields like software engineering. So this next generation is thinking, geez, you know, I could be let go at any time. And I think as a result, they're thinking about stability as something that's really important. How important is financial compensation for Gen Z? It's right near the top. I would argue, based on our data, that work-life balance is probably the thing that they care most about. Right near the top is also training and development, because I think they've noticed that the world is so complicated today, like with AI coming in and challenging so many entry-level jobs. Gen Z has really started to latch onto the idea that they have to become lifelong learners. They have to grow and develop over time. And so they're looking for opportunities to do that within organizations. They're kind of putting the responsibility of the training on the employer. But probably right below those two things, we start to get into the area of salary and stability. And it's probably, well, our data certainly suggests that it's more important than things like workplace friendships, which was a really big deal for the millennial generation. Millennials were all about who, who am I going to work with? Am I going to report up to someone who I care about and who cares about me? Gen Z, I think, is a little more pragmatic and they're talking about the structural elements of the job, like how much is this going to pay me? And it kind of makes sense. If you look at the cost of living in so many Canadian cities, who's going to blame them? What do they not care about? One of the things that I can very confidently say they do not care about is organizational prestige. I've run several surveys over a few years. And when I look at data sets from colleagues at other universities, other researchers, um, particularly North America, the idea of a brand that's somehow better than some other brand just doesn't seem to be where Gen Z wants to go. And it makes sense, I think, because they're so welcoming of diversity. Diversity is sort of the antithesis of being better than, right? Diversity kind of means we're all the same, but in our own ways. So when we've asked students, like, do you want to go graduate and work for a place that's, you know, the number one in their field? They say, no, it's really not important. Um, they also really don't seem to care about travel and relocation. Uh, something that was kind of a classic perk, especially 20 or 30 years ago, if your employer was paying for a certain number of travel days or something like that, free plane tickets every once in a while, if that was a carrot that could sweeten the pot, um, that might have been more attractive to previous generations. But for whatever reason, Gen Z just doesn't seem to be particularly interested in that. They really are focused on what does this day-to-day -day lived experience of working in an organization mean for me? How is it going to fit in with other areas of my life? Is this an organization where I get to be myself? And are they going to help me learn and grow over time? Okay, so do you feel that Canadian workplaces and organizations understand gen values and that, or that they're making a, a greater effort to? I think the best organizations are going to be the ones that get this right. Because the most recent stats that I think I've seen is something like by 2030, about a third of the global workforce is going to be Gen Z. So if you don't understand Gen Z, you're up a creek without a paddle. I think the best organizations are going to get this right and they're going to start to ask the questions and they're going to listen and they're going to start adjusting to welcome the new workforce. They're going to make changes that are consistent with that generation. If the question is, are they doing that right now? I'm not convinced that they are. And I think the canary in the coal mine is the flexible work arrangement. In our data, something like 77, 78% of Gen Z is saying, when I graduate, I'd love to have a hybrid job way more than the folks are saying, I want to work remotely entirely. They actually do like the social connection. They just don't want it five days a week. My understanding is lots of organizations are asking people to come back in every single day that they're working. So there's clearly a difference there, especially in some of the major cities where commute times is a massive factor when we talk about the sort of lived experience and work-life balance. So I'm not, I'm not convinced right now that lots of organizations are listening, but they better. Are there any specific ways that you think that Gen Z's values are different from past generations in terms of them being generational versus just young, right? So did boomers have similar values in the 70s that sort of faded with age? Or are these specific to this generation, despite the fact that there's these decades of years between them? This is a really complicated matter, and it's usually dealt with through really sophisticated research designs and statistics. The question is essentially, is this a generational thing or is this just an age thing? Aren't young people always this way? And then as they get older, they change. Folks much smarter than me have asked that question and have come to a conclusion that's somewhere in the middle. There certainly is an age effect. Sometimes they call it a cohort effect. But then there are, there are legitimate generational differences. And they know this because 
using really longitudinal data, you can look at a given generation and compare them sort of apples to apples, an 18 year old in 1970 and an 18-year- old in 2024, and you can see how they differ. So we actually are pretty confident that there are legitimate generational differences based on the research. Mm-hmm. What kind of a mark do you think Gen Z could leave on the workplace? If we're going, let's fast forward like 10 or 20 years. What do you think that their mark will be? I think their mark is going to be enormous. I think that because there's so many of them, organizations will only survive if they respond to the needs of Gen Z. And I think we'll probably all be better off for it because I think it will inevitably lead to organizational cultures that are more welcoming of diversity It will lead to organizational cultures that invest to a greater extent in learning and development, which is good for everyone, people and the organizations. Hopefully, if we're really lucky, Gen Z will, on everyone's behalf, put their foot down and say, we need greater work-life balance, which again, benefits everyone. And if we're incredibly lucky, Gen Z will do something that creates more job stability so that people don't have to look for gig work time and time again, that we can create space for people to have longer lasting relationships with their employers, which is something that was enjoyed for many decades until recently. So if we're really lucky, Gen Z is gonna come in and make a massive impact and it's gonna benefit everyone. Like it or not, Gen Z is coming to a workplace near you. Now the question is how employers will adapt. Roma, what are your takeaways? One, it's great to have a job that aligns with your values, but starting off has never been more expensive. So keep that in mind when making career decisions. Two, work-life balance is the future of work, and employers have never been more open to it. Use that to your advantage. Three, keep a close eye on the job market. If the economy slows or we get a recession, it will be a lot harder to switch jobs. Thank you for listening to Stress Test. This show was produced by Kyle Fulton, Emily Jackson, and Zara Kazema. Our executive producer is Alicia Sawney. Thank you to Batul, Mikhail, and Dave for joining us. Next week on Stress Test. Opening a tax-free savings account is a straightforward process, but what comes next is more challenging. Investing and growing those savings. We speak with young Canadians who are putting their money to work and ask them what they have in their TFSAs. Until then, find us at theglobeandmail.com. Thanks for listening.